So can you tell us uh, your area of expertise? I'm Sylvia Earle. I have an interest in the ocean. It's been my, my life's work, if you will. Currently, I'm explorer in residence at the National Geographic, and I also head an ocean program for Conservation International and work with a number of organizations, including those that actually build little submarines, deep ocean exploration and research. But as a little girl, I got knocked over by a wave in New Jersey. The ocean got my attention, and it's held my attention ever since. It was really, and still is, life in the ocean, though, that has lured me there and kept me there. Those big horseshoe crabs that came ashore, and still do, along the coast of the eastern seaboard of the United States, they've been around for 400 million years. But in our time, my time, their future is at risk. That got my attention, seeing in just a matter of a few years, these creatures that once were so abundant, they made roads and fences and fertilizer out of them, are now in trouble. What, and this is spurred our <coughs> conversation just now, can you tell us, can you describe planet Earth for us and mm. how it works? Astronauts can tell you that Earth is unique, not just in the solar system, but in the universe. This is the blue planet. It is shaped by the ocean. The ocean makes this planet what it is. Some say, oh, 65 or 67 or sometimes 70% of the Earth's surface is water. But it isn't just the surface that counts. The biosphere, the part of the planet that is inhabited, that's 97% ocean. So the land certainly counts, and all the critters on the land count. But what shapes the planet, what makes life possible on Earth, is water. And most of it is ocean water. 97% of Earth's water is ocean. The 3% that remains is largely locked up in polar ice. 97% of that is ice. So the fresh water that most people think of as water, rivers, lakes, streams, water that falls from the sky, from clouds, that's uh, certainly an important part of what drives the living world. But it's the ocean that provides the water. Every drop of water that you drink, every breath that you take, you're linked to the ocean. Because it's the ocean that generates the, most of the oxygen that goes up into the atmosphere. It's certainly the ocean that is the source of fresh water that goes up into clouds, comes back as rain, sleet, snow, recharges rivers and lakes and groundwater. So as simply as you can state it, um, so why, so why, when we do it, and we got another way, why are oceans important? How do they fit into the web of life? And what do they provide the planet, and what do they provide us? And explain again in women's terms. An Australian reporter once asked me why she should care about the ocean. It took me back a bit because nobody had really put that question to me before. She said, I don't swim. Uh, I, I don't um, go out on boats because I get seasick. I don't eat fish. People don't drink salt water. So why should not only I care, why should anybody care about the ocean? And it put me back a bit, but I responded ultimately by saying, OK, how about Mars? I said, think Mars. There's a place with no ocean, uh, no pesky ocean, <laughs> no ocean that you need care about. There was apparently an ocean on Mars once, but not anymore. This planet is blessed with all that blue, an ocean that has an average depth of two and a half miles, maximum depth seven miles, 11 kilometers. It's, this place is shaped by its ocean generates most of the oxygen, absorbs much of the carbon dioxide. It shapes the chemistry of the planet. It governs climate, weather, stabilizes temperature. Without the ocean, this planet would be as bleak, as barren, as inhospitable as Mars. Now, we may set up housekeeping on Mars someday. We certainly are sending little probes up there. But to send human beings to Mars means we'll have to take our life support system with us. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, a place to really make it hospitable for the likes of us. That's not an easy challenge, <laughs> certainly not for six billion people. We can survive here. All life on Earth can survive on this planet, basically because there is all that water, 
97% of it in the ocean. It is the cornerstone of what makes our life as well as all the rest of life on Earth possible. So what good is the ocean? Well, if you want to live, better take care of the ocean. What we're doing to the ocean now is also an issue. What we're putting into the sea, what we're taking out of the ocean. When I was a child, it was thought that the ocean is so big, so vast, that there isn't much that we humans can do to alter its nature. Lord Byron spoke of this years ago, saying that the ocean was in basically infinite. And even when Rachel Carson talked about the ocean in her beautiful book in the 1950s, The Sea Around Us, there was the impression given that she thought, as many did, that the ocean was basically so resilient, so large, that the, the things that we're concerned about on the land didn't necessarily apply to the sea. Well, we're learning very quickly in half a century that the things that we thought were true back half a century ago are simply not so. We do have the capacity to alter the nature of the ocean itself and thus the way the planet works. Through what we're putting into the atmosphere, we're changing the ocean. It comes down to basic things like global warming that are accelerating processes that have been going on for <laughs> forever, I suppose. Sea level has been higher and lower. Climate has been warmer and colder over the ages. But in our time, in my time, the planet is being influenced through our actions. The, the planet is being influenced through our actions. Since the 1950s, what we've taken out of the ocean is drastic. We have seen the depletion of the big fish in the ocean. Fish that we like to eat, that's why they're depleted. <laughs> Things like swordfish, tuna, cod, sharks, grouper, snapper, you know, go down the long list of things that people like to eat. Water is not just water, although we treat it that way when we think of water as something we drink or whatever, but basically water is filled with life. The ocean is a living soup. Every spoonful of water has life in it. So when we think about what shapes the character of Earth, and we think about the ocean and say it's water, it is, but it's really the life in the sea that shapes the character of the ocean, and thus the way the world works. It's life in the sea, not just water, that's generating the oxygen, that is absorbing the carbon dioxide. One of the most abundant creatures on the planet is in a category of small critters that are known as coccolithophorids. They're, they photosynthesize. They take the sunlight's energy, turn it into food, and generate oxygen. They're very important little creatures. Not just that one group, but there are thousands of kinds of organisms out there in the ocean, planktonic organisms that live largely in that upper 100 meters of the ocean, where sunlight penetrates and drives photosynthesis that drives the production of, production of oxygen and the production of food that, that makes the food chains possible. When you sit down and think about a, a piece of fish, whatever kind of fish you want to, I'll choose tuna, because tuna is one of the most threatened species or group of species on the planet. There are 60 or so variations on the theme of tuna-like fish. Tuna fish, tuna sandwiches, tuna uh, sushi and sashimi, tuna steaks. Uh, we have managed to turn tuna into many variations on the thing, thing, uh, things, themes of things to eat. But what's it take to make a tuna? It starts with sunlight, going through the little plants that capture the sunlight, then the small organisms that eat those little plants, and the somewhat smaller, larger things that eat the small ones, and this long and complicated food chain to get to small fish that are eaten by somewhat larger fish, that are eaten by something, finally, that a tuna will notice. To make a pound of chicken takes maybe 10 pounds of plants in the course of a year. No, about two pounds of plants to make a pound of chicken. To make a pound of beef, a cow, is about 20 pounds of plants. To make a pound of tuna fish, think thousands of pounds of plants invested through this long and complicated food chain. Every step of the way, energy is lost. Some is retained. But by the time you get to even a year-old tuna fish that is really too small to be of interest to most of us, 
to get to a kind of tuna that is taken, that appears in the markets, that appears finally in our restaurants and supermarkets, we're talking at least six or eight years, maybe ten. Or, if it's a lucky tuna that has been around as long as tunas normally live, it might be twenty years old, or even more. Think of the investment out of the ocean to make the kinds of things that we extract out of the ocean. It is no wonder that in a short period of time we have succeeded, given our new technology, to find, capture, and market food from the sea on the order of now nearly a hundred million tons of wildlife, wild creatures taken from the sea, starting with those small ones at the bottom of the food chain that are invested in crabs, shrimp, tuna, grouper, snapper, rockfish, you name the fish that you like to eat, there's a big investment out of the food chains in the sea for every little bite that you, you take. Looking out at the ocean, it's logical to wonder, where did all that water come from? And most people don't even appreciate how much water there is, that realizing that it's the average depth is two and a half miles, that the maximum depth is seven miles, or that 97% of Earth's water is out there in the ocean. Whatever, it's a lot of water, and it's a lot of life in the water. But where did, where did it start? Of course, we weren't there to witness all this, so we can only indirectly speculate about how water came to be here or elsewhere in the universe. What we have found in recent times is that water a planet like this one is rare. In fact, we know of no other in the universe that is close to what this planet is like. But water is not rare. Comets are considered to be snowballs, dirt and, and ice, all kind of glommed together. And what is this ice? It's water. The moon of Jupiter, known as Europa, is thought to have a lot of water, with oceans even deeper than what we have on this planet but with a solid matrix of ice over what is thought to be liquid water below. When volcanic action occurs, water is part of the process. Steam is generated. And when that steam cools, there is, guess what, water. And it's thought that there was, in the early days of the formation of this planet, that there was steam that ultimately formed clouds that rained and formed much of the basis of the oceans that we now take for granted. But it hasn't stopped there. Uh, more recent evidence suggests that we are constantly getting a rain of some water from outside, and the water that's out there beyond our own atmosphere. And that in the early days of Earth, this was a process that was much more obvious than it is today. Uh, and it's amazing that we're still getting extraterrestrial stuff raining down through our atmosphere that hits the Earth. The little little stone-like things called tectites arrive on the planet all the time. We know about meteorites and, and whatever, but we're, we're just a piece of this vast solar system. And within that, this enormous universe, it's a miracle, one would think, that we exist at all, that Earth exists. This special place with an atmosphere that is just right for the likes of us and the rest of life on Earth. The key to it is not just the existence of water, it's the existence of life that has shaped the character of this place that somehow holds it steady in this ever-changing solar system, ever-changing universe. What we know for sure is that Earth has changed enormously from its early beginnings some four and a half billion years ago. And it's changing still. There are processes over which we have no control. But the scary thing, the awesome thing, the thing that might be taken as a well, sense of opportunity, is that we have the power to really influence these processes. The warming trend that we've witnessed in certainly my lifetime is just a part of a broader trend that started ages ago. And the warming trend certainly at the end of the last ice age, when the glaciers that once covered North America, much of it, have been receding. <laughs> I lived in Florida for years. I still have a home there. I'm mindful that where I now live was once covered with water, and it will be again, because sea level historically has gone up, it's gone down, as ice ages have come and gone. But we have seen, in just this latest little piece of time, 
an acceleration of this process because of things that we have done to the land, to the sea, to the atmosphere. And we are inheriting the consequences of our actions. What we put into the ocean, millions of tons of things that aren't natural to the sea, that come back to us in perverse ways. The fish, of course, are subjected to it and the other life in the sea. Some fish concentrate these substances, things like mercury, that are concentrated the further up the food chain you go, so that when you get to a creature like a shark or a swordfish or a tuna, high on the food chain, much higher than lions and tigers are on the land, because they eat carnivores, they eat carnivores, they eat carnivores, and finally you get down to the grazers, whereas lions and tigers merely eat grazers low on the food chain. But these high on the food chain carnivores have huge concentrations of the things that are there in small amounts if you're low on the food chain. And they come back to us in concentrated ways, whether they're PCBs or mercury or you know, heavy metals of various sorts, the pesticides, the herbicides, the fire retardants that ultimately get washed into the sea, either deliberately dumped there or put there through rivers, lakes, and streams that flow into the sea. We are now suffering the consequences largely of our ignorance, of not knowing that it matters. Years ago, it was thought that the ocean is so big, so vast, so resilient, that we didn't have the capacity to alter the way it works through what we put in, and certainly not through what we take out. Even in the 1960s, on into the 70s, there was this attitude that the ocean is so rich with life that we only had to think better ways to take what was there and to find new markets for things like sharks, new ways to exploit tuna fish, cod, and other things that, well, we'd already seen the trends start to slip and slide downward for things like cod and certain grouper, snapper, and other things for which we'd begun to acquire a taste for them. Um, there was a time when lobsters were regarded as not something that people would really want to eat, as a, certainly not as a luxury food. But over the years, our habits have changed. When I was a kid, nobody ate raw fish. <laughs> a few people did, and it was a cultural uh, thing in certain Asian countries that raw fish was not only okay, but it was a delicacy. But now it's common. You can go to restaurants all over the world and find raw fish as sushi and sashimi that is pampered fish, pampered in the sense that fish are taken out of the sea and then not the fish themselves, but the, the flesh of the fish, so that it comes to you still really fresh, even though it may have come from an ocean half a world away, because it is now prized. It's not feeding starving millions, it's not required for us to eat, but it's become something that is a, a luxury taste but it isn't limited to things like tuna, or certain kinds of shrimp, or certain kinds of crab. We have begun to look at wildlife in the sea in the way that certain wildlife on the land has begun to come into the market as a, as a luxury taste. Some people are worried about what's happening to wildlife on the land because of a trend that, that it makes as a, a special treat to have a lion steak or to have a certain kind of monkey to eat. I mean, it, you, you might say, that's terrible. But on the other hand, think of what we eat from the ocean. These are the equivalents. These are wild creatures taken out of the natural systems and brought to our tables for our momentary pleasure. But a thing like, let's say, an orange roughy that was on nobody's menu 30 years ago, new on the restaurants and supermarkets of the world, for a relatively small price. You can buy orange roughy for less than a good cut of beef. But to make an orange roughy, at least 50 years before it comes to market, it may be 100, 150 years. These are old fish. They're not big fish, but they're old fish. It takes 30 years for them to mature. We've only begun taking them in recent years, in part because we've kind of run out of other things to eat from the sea. Their numbers have been depleted over just a few decades, so that we've lost 90% of most of the big fish in the sea in half a century. So we're turning to deeper areas, further areas offshore, so that now sea mounts, mountains in the sea that you can't even find from the surface unless you're equipped with the new technologies that were developed largely during 
the Second World War, during this Cold War era, new technologies that now make it hard for fish to hide, hard for fish to escape. New technologies that enable us to go down thousands of feet into the ocean, and not only find the fish, but then capture them and bring them back and export them to markets all over the world. Therefore, we are seeing fish that we didn't even know existed before, now right on the edge of going over the edge to extinction because of our capacity to find them and capture them and market them, and in the process to destroy the very systems, the habitats that give rise to them. T to take something like an orange roughy means taking a trawl and scraping these mountains in the sea. Using, like using a bulldozer to capture songbirds or squirrels, you take the whole system. In the case of Orange Ruffy, you're taking thousand-year-old corals that are certainly not going to grow back in a short period of time to restore the habitat that gives rise to the creatures. And if a creature takes 30 years to mature, might be older than your great-grandparents by the time you eat them, that's not going to come back overnight either. It's not sustainable. We should have as a goal finding a place, an enduring place for ourselves within the natural systems that keep us alive, that sustain us. But if we destroy those mechanisms, if we go as we are going into the sea with these heavy-handed techniques for trawling the sea floor to capture shrimp, bottom fish, things like orange ruffy, but a lot of other things as well, we're not doing anything that is really sensible if we want to protect our life support system, because what matters to the fish really matters to us in the end. The fish obviously are connected to the ocean, but so are we. With every breath we take, with every drop of water that we drink, we are connected to the ocean. Our capacity to alter the way the ocean works through what we're taking out of the sea, disrupting these fine-tuned food webs that have developed over hundreds of millions of years. And we are now disrupting them by taking out the big predators, by even taking out the grazers, the parrotfish, the mullet, other creatures that are low on the food chain, but still are critical components. The, the turtles, the manatees, these have all just crashed in terms of their earlier abundance. And with the crash of their populations, so have these intricate food webs that provides stability. We want stability in the way the ocean works. We want things to stay kind of on an even course if we want to live on this planet. Now, life will go on with us or without us. The little guys rule. They always have, <laughs> they always will. When I say little guys, I mean the microbes. Life in the sea depends on the existence of the small things at the bottom of the food chain. Bacteria, the viruses, the plankton, and the things that ultimately feed on them are shaped by them. Going back to the beginning of life on Earth several billion years ago, microbes ruled. That's all there were. There weren't any big things at all. No multicellular life. Certainly nothing like dinosaurs, or ultimately nothing like us. But over the ages, those little guys, the microbes, shaped the character of this planet, made it hospitable for bigger things, and ultimately have made it hospitable for the likes of us. They still rule. In the ocean today, scientists are out sampling the nature of life at the small scale. Years ago, I had a life-changing conversation with a scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution this is Holger Janisch, after whom the first of the whole kingdom of life, known as the Archaea, first species, was, was named, Archaea Janischi. Now, Holger Janisch <laughs> was such a great scientist and a great human being, and one who really appreciated the importance of the small things and how much they matter to all of us. Uh, he understood that, that these microbes shape the way the world works shape the chemistry of the planet, certainly shape the ocean, and therefore the chemistry of the planet, and that, that the diversity of life on the micro scale is so enormous. I mean, think of bacteria that were then being reported that were being 
analyzed using the new genetic techniques that are available, weren't available when Holger Janisch was a, a young scientist or when I was. The way that you determine how many, uh, what kind of bacteria were in the ocean, you, you plated them out on various kinds of culture media. Well, it turns out most of the bacteria that live in the sea and other small creatures don't like the specific media that we were, the food that we were offering them to grow. They had other tastes. And it's only in very recent times that we're beginning to appreciate the enormous diversity of life at the, this microbial scale in the ocean. One of the breakthroughs came in the 1970s, late 70s, with the discovery of hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. And nobody knew they existed at all until the late 70s, or that the sea floor really is spreading, and that around certain areas, these plumes of hot water laden with minerals and bacteria are jetting out of the deep sea. It was there that the archaea were discovered, and along with them, many other forms of life on a micro scale as well as larger creatures, new kinds of fish and crabs and shrimp that no one had ever seen before. Now we know this is a really common process around the oceans of the world in the deep sea as we gain access to the ocean. We're learning so many things, but even near the surface, a scientist who is best known for his work with the human genome, Craig Ventner, has turned his attention to looking at the genome of these little guys in the ocean and is traveling around the world on his sailboat, taking little spoonfuls of water and analyzing how many of what kinds of creatures live at various parts in the ocean. He started out near the Sargasso Sea, where the water is clear, it's blue, it's thought to be, and books will tell you, that it is essentially a desert in the ocean, that not much lives there. Well, tell the microbes that, because in this first little sample that he took, he found more than a thousand variations on the theme of microbes, bacteria, if you will, in that first little glob of water. <laughs> Most of them were new, newly reported, new kinds, so call them species, if you will. A short distance away, he took another little scoop of water. Same thing. More than a thousand variations on the theme of these little forms of life. Thing is, there wasn't much overlap between the sample taken here and the sample taken over there. Makes you wonder, look at the oceans of the world. What is there out there that we have yet to know? 95% of the ocean has yet to be seen, let alone explored. And when you get down to the micro level, it just boggles your mind about the magnitude of our ignorance. And we know enough to know that the ocean is in trouble. We know enough to know that we have the capacity and we are, in fact, changing the ocean through our actions, through what we're putting in, through what we're taking out. But what else can we learn if we take care of this treasure chest of knowledge, the things that could really shape our lives in positive ways, give us some hope of having, let's say, a span of life on Earth as long as dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were here for a very long time as life on Earth goes. Species come, species go over the ages. Whole categories of life come and go. Dinosaurs were around in various forms for about 150 million years. And then through cataclysmic events that caused great changes to the planet, they disappeared. We have some hope of avoiding some of the problems, at least, the cataclysmic events that we are causing if we are smart enough to read the signs and then to take actions ourselves to do what we have to do to find an enduring place on this magical blue planet that is unique in the universe. We have this, we're blessed with this ability, this curiosity, first of all, to want to know and to find things out. And right now, as never before, we have the capacity to start weaving patterns together with the new technologies that give us insight that our predecessors could dream about, but they really couldn't achieve. We now know that we are at a pivotal point in history. Perhaps the next 10 years may be the most important year, piece of time in the next thousand years because of these trends that we're seeing, and we're sitting right in the middle of it. Global warming is taking place. We're seeing through the increase in carbon carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
an increased carbon, carbon dioxide, in the ocean, which is causing the acidification of the ocean. Carbonic acid is being formed with this excess carbon. Now, it perhaps has happened in times past, but it's happening now on our watch through our actions. We can do something about this. Why should you worry about acidification in the ocean? I mean, did you even know that the ocean has something that is not acid? I mean, people just don't know. Ocean is at the other end of the acid scale. It's basic. If you take a piece of litmus paper that goes pink, if you put it in something that is acid or goes blue, if it is on the scale that's on the other end of acidification, if it's basic, put a piece of litmus paper in the ocean today, it's blue. It is still basic, but the trend is increasingly acid. That's a worry. It's a worry because the little shells around many of the planktonic creatures are calcium carbonate. They're affected by increased acid in the ocean, or character of the ocean. And so, suppose we disrupt the food chains in the sea, because the coccolithophorids that have these little calcium carbonate shells sort of fall to pieces and aren't generating oxygen, aren't fixing carbon as food for life in the sea. What happens? What happens to us, to the things we take for granted? Never mind the fish. These are things that for the first time we know about and therefore we can care about and we can thus motivate it, maybe do something about it. These are the links showing how the ocean, how life on Earth, how the natural systems that drive our life support system matter to us and why should why should we worry? Why should we care? Because it's our life that's at, at stake. We should take care of the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. This is um, so we went through a lot. I want to go back just to, um, because you've been talking about a lot of the challenges. Yeah. I wonder if you can um, for the camera and then go back into drawing it out, what are the biggest challenges facing the ocean okay. in the yeah. form? And then you can <coughs> expand on why those challenges, what are we facing here? Mm-hmm. Between, I guess, global warming, overfishing, we've been talking about. Um, I don't know what else there is. Okay, all right. For the first time in a long time, the ocean is attracting attention as something really important for human survival, for human security, for human health, for all the things that matter to human beings. Just in very recent years, for the first time in decades, the National Ocean Commission was formed to look at the ocean and what it means to human beings, what we're doing and what we perhaps shouldn't be doing. The Pew Ocean Commission, a privately funded initiative, caused a number of experts to get together over a period of three years to evaluate why the oceans matter to us, what's happening to the ocean, what should we be doing that we're not now doing. And I was very much a part of something called Defying Ocean's End that was coordinated by Conservation International but involved more than 70 organizations from 20 countries, 150 people who gathered in Mexico in 2003 and took on this challenge. Okay, we have these major issues, these major problems that are influencing our everyday lives. And what can we do? What are we doing? And and how can we make a difference? Can we come up with an action plan to address these issues? What are we going to do about ignorance, about the fact that people, first of all, don't understand the connection between the ocean and ourselves, except maybe that's a place to go get fish they like to eat, or Recreation. Recreation is huge as far as why people care about the ocean. They love to swim, they love to sail, they love to go out fishing and things of that sort. But at the end of, well, what does it really mean in terms of my life? Well, that's what this conference really focused on. And the fact that we are overfishing, taking too much out of the ocean, we're putting too much into the sea. The fact that global warming is a phenomenon that affects every form of life on Earth especially looking at, from our selfish standpoint, what what does that mean to us? And over a period of a year before this conference and during the conference itself, we not only addressed these things like communication, how do we 
get people to understand why the oceans matter. Looked at governance issues around the world. If you look at where nations have control of the ocean, it goes out now to 200 miles. If you drew a map of the real United States, it would be at least twice as big, actually more than twice as big as it is today. If you take in the ocean component, the, the exclusive economic zone out 200 miles. But beyond that, 64% of the ocean has no national governance. It's the Wild West out there. People kind of get away with whatever they want to do. Some few nations are out fishing in the high seas. That's what this area is called. The blue heart of the ocean, the blue heart of the planet, is really not protected through guidelines of behavior, policies that would govern fisheries, and other things, the dumping of materials that people around the world have said, we don't want that close to our backyard. But if you take it offshore, it's OK. <laughs> it's not OK. It's all part of this same interconnected life support system called the ocean. We're getting better, and there are some policies about what we put into the ocean in the high seas, policies that now restrict plastics and other things that we don't really want to be in the ocean. We are having some policies with regard to some groups of animals, such as whales, marine mammals generally, that govern international policies for the taking of tuna, of a few species. And, and we're getting better about some things. But generally speaking, we are ignoring the heart of the planet and what makes it work. The ocean really needs people to sit up, first of all, take notice. We concluded at this conference in Mexico and decided that governance is an issue, communication is an issue, looking at exploration and research. How do we actually know what's out there unless we amp up our technologies and our commitment, just as we have for space in the last 50 years? What we know about our role in the greater scheme of things, and speaking of the universe, it has largely come because of our willingness to invest in looking in the skies above and then back on ourselves from that perspective. But how about looking at ourselves from within? Let's explore the ocean only once in human history. Have two people, has anybody, been to the deepest part of the ocean? And it's only seven miles down. We fly seven miles in the air, watching movies, eating lunch, <laughs> telling stories, reading books in aircraft. In the ocean, it was 1960 when two men, for about half an hour, made observations at the deepest part of the sea. Nobody has been back since. Well, maybe people have been down there because one-way trips are easy. But what we really want is true exploration of the ocean in safe ways, using robots, using submersibles that will take us there with the equivalent of what's taking us high in the sky. We have the technology. We have, have to really dedicate our will to use the technology, to recognize its importance to us uh, knowing about the ocean. So that's one of the, the big initiatives. Another thing that we really looked at at this conference, and the conference goes on, we continue to meet and deliberate about what we can do. The process is continuing to try to figure out not only what do we have to do, but how's it going to what's it going to cost, and where are we going to find the resources to really make a difference on the scale that we have the opportunity now, maybe the obligation to do right now. Because as never before, we know we've got a problem. Maybe as never again, we have a chance to do something about it. If we wait 10 years, look at the trends of where big fish were half a century ago. 90% are gone. Coral reefs, when I was a kid, were in pretty good health all over the planet. In just a matter of a few decades, their health has taken a downhill spiral. They were here, now about half are either gone or they are in really bad shape. Maybe 30% gone, but another 20% on in sharp decline. The good news is about half the coral reefs are still out there in still pretty good shape. 
we've still got 10% of the big fish. Well, some it's less than 2%, but in others, even 2%, there's still a chance. The last bluefin tuna is still out. It hasn't yet been turned into sushi and sashimi. They're still there. We've still got a chance. There's still enough turtles to recover. We stopped killing whales, by and large, in the, in the 80s and on into the 90s, commercially at least. Some are still taken around the world, but we've seen a recovery of some, like the gray whale in California. It's a good news story. Striped bass on the East Coast were almost at the point of going out over the edge of extinction in the 1980s. But a policy was put into place to stop killing them totally for five years and they recovered. They haven't gone back to what they were 500 years ago, but they're better than they were 50 years ago, enough so that some modest take is now possible. It's not a guarantee that a species, when it gets down to a really low level, will recover, can recover. Passenger pigeons still numbered in the thousands when basically it was over for them. They needed a critical mass in order to be able to recover to their former abundance or something that was anything close to it. We're at the level now with many species in the ocean that are at the point of perhaps no return. What we do or what we don't do will make all the difference in this next decade, this most critical, pivotal point in history. But we have a chance. We can make a difference through what we do, through what we don't do. What would happen if we don't make the changes that are necessary? What do you think? Have you ever thought about that? And what would happen to us? If humankind goes on business as usual, <laughs> think of the consequences. Okay, we have some things in place now that are stabilizing the natural systems that support us. We have a network of national parks around the world, in fact. Good idea in this country that started in the late 1800s, continued through the 20th century, and is continuing now into the 21st. A modest reflection of that in the ocean. About 12% of the land worldwide is held in some form of protection. Not enough if you're going to protect our life support system, <laughs> but it's a good start. I mean, how much of your heart would you want to keep if you wanted to protect your heart? 12%? That's not good enough. But if we couple these protected areas with overarching policies, like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, the, these things that are, provide overarching guidelines for behavior, not just in this country, in the United States, but globally. It's reflected in policies that are coming into focus in the 20th century, now into the 21st. But if we stop now, just make do with whatever we've got, continue fishing policies right exactly as they are today, no new constraints on how much we're taking, no new guidelines for the kind of gear that we're using, so that it's okay to use trawls to go out and scrape the sea floor, like using bulldozers to catch songbirds and squirrels in the Gulf of Mexico, in the North Sea, all over the world, in Australia, wherever. We will see the loss of species that now we take for granted when we go to restaurants and supermarkets. When you see a 90% decline in 50 years, Here's where the species were. Here's where they are. Where are they going to be? Not in the next 50 years, but in the next 10 years. They'll be gone. We have the capacity to catch and to consume the very last bluefin tuna, the very last turtle. Although turtles, in theory, are protected, sea turtles are, in the ocean, much of the critical part of their life history is not the land where they come to nest. We could lose leatherbacks, not because we're eating them, but because we're catching them in nets intended to catch something else. They're being strangled, they're being drowned, they're being killed, they're being lost. They've been around for such a long period of time. We should so, show some respect. I don't know how to make a turtle. I don't know how to make a bluefin tuna. I don't know how to make a snail. I don't know how to make the tiniest form of living creature. Some say that the value of natural systems to humankind 
can be calculated on the basis of something on the order of $33 trillion a year benefits that we get from the natural systems. Okay, it's a lot of money, but give me $33 trillion and assign me a task of trying to build our life support system. I don't know how to start from scratch and do it, given the, any amount of money you want to put at the problem, any amount of engineering skills at my disposal, scientific skills, $33 trillion makes our national budget look, I mean, whatever. We could use all of that. And we would, or national debt, let's take that and apply it to trying to build a new planet. I don't know with all of that money that I couldn't make a single living thing. I don't know how to do it. Maybe someday we will be able to construct life from scratch, from the basic elements. But a whole planet that works, the equivalent of four and a half billion years of fine tuning with all of these creatures that have been living all this time, shaping the character of a place that just happens to be just right for humankind. We have the challenge of taking care of this treasure and making sure that we do everything we can to not lose it, to restore to the best of our ability what's been lost, and certainly to value what it is really worth to us with every breath we take, every drop of water we consume, every day that we live. That's what the ocean should be to us. People naturally ask, oh, so populations of fish in the ocean are in trouble? And oh, by the way, they're loaded with things that I don't want in me, like mercury. So what am I going to eat? I come, up, come from a, a family who loves seafood, and I have to say I've consumed more than my fair share over the years. But I've stopped. I've stopped for reasons that relate to what I know. I know too much, and I care. I care about fish in the ocean alive now more than I do swimming with lemon slices and butter. I'd rather they be swimming out in the ocean. I value grouper alive now that I know what they're like, because I've seen them in action, know how important they are to the integrity of ocean ecosystems. And I also just, it just baffles me why we would think it's okay to take creatures that are older than our grandparents and just have them for lunch. It just doesn't make sense. Many of the creatures that we now take and think nothing about the few minutes that it, it takes for us to eat them, what it has taken for them to get to our plate. Sharks may be 20 or 30 years old. Orange Ruffy be 100 years old or 150 years old. California rockfish live a very long time. They mature slowly. They may be 100 years old by the time they come to our plate. 25-year-old rockfish what used to be common. Now it's hard to find rockfish at all. You're still in markets. It's still possible to go get them because we haven't drained the ocean of all of its life yet. We still keep finding new places to go. But the places that we started with are increasingly barren of life. Cod used to be right up near the shore. When fishermen began taking from the, the seas around New England in the 1600s, if you read the manuscripts, the stories of our early arrivals from Europe, the, the abundance of, of wildlife in the sea was, was just something that we can barely imagine today, but the records are there. Chesapeake Bay, 400 years ago, was so filled with life, and it wasn't the murky Chesapeake Bay that you see today. San Francisco Bay was so different when two years before the mast was written, when Richard Henry Dana came to California, the wildlife in the ocean as well as on the land was just so different. Wildlife on the land, we understand, we cannot feed billions of people with wildlife, songbirds and little furry things. Without agriculture, without cultivating what we, what we consume, we could certainly not support six billion people from what we take from the wild. And that's true from both the sea as well as from the land. Today, what we take from the sea, it's about 100 million tons, but 
compared to what we take from the land, what we grow, it's a tiny fraction of what supports humankind. In fact, about half the calories that support humankind come from three plants, three categories of plants, rice, wheat, and corn. That's the big driver for what makes us work. That's our fuel. It not only supports us, but it supports the animals that we grow. Well, think about growing animals. We don't grow carnivores. We don't grow lions and tigers, let alone the creatures that might eat lions and tigers. In the ocean, we are taking top-of-the-line predators, carnivores, that are far up the food chain, much further up the food chain than lions and tigers. The investment in a tuna, in a swordfish, in a Chilean sea bass, in a cod, in a halibut, you name the fish you like to eat. Think about what it has taken to make one. And if you continue to eat them, well, eat them with great respect. It's like eating somebody as old as your ancestors. And what you've taken out of the ocean is not easily put back in. We're mining the ocean of these old creatures. It, I mean, generations may pass before, if we stopped killing them now, before you get some kind of restoration toward, to, toward the, the earlier numbers that our parents and grandparents took for granted. In our time, we've, in my time, the capacity to empty the oceans has been demonstrated with our new technologies to find and catch and, and export. And here's another terrible thing that we need to think about with respect to what we take out of the ocean. In the process of taking many of the fish, we take a lot of other things. The bycatch issue, tons of other things are removed from the sea in the process of what we actually take to market. For shrimp, it's on the order of 10 to 1. Things that are captured, thrown away. New gear helps, but it doesn't really solve the problem. It's like saying, for every cow that goes to market, we're going to take, you know, so many foxes, so many eagles, so many bushes, so many this, that. This huge pile of incidental catch. Every year, hundreds of thousands of marine mammals are killed in the process of catching fish, killed and thrown away. That's the cost of doing business with commercial fishing the way it's done today. Hundreds of thousands of seabirds, likewise, are captured and killed in the process of taking fish the way we're doing business today. That's the real cost that's not being paid for when you buy <laughs> your fish from the fish market, supermarket, or when you go to a restaurant and order wild-caught things. So what are you going to eat? <laughs> I ask that question myself. I look at the menu, I see all this wildlife on the, on the menu, things that we shouldn't be consuming. You think somebody's looking out for these things. Well, here's the thing. You should be looking out for what goes into your body. Know where it came from. We are getting that way in terms of the vegetables and the fruits and other things that we eat. Is it organically raised? How much pesticide has gone here or there? But have you ever thought as you consume fish, how much of the ecosystem is being taken out of the ocean in order to get this little piece of something to me? And where has it been swimming? And what has it been eating? How much fire retardant is in this little piece of salmon? How much mercury is in that little piece of shark or tuna? We don't have the same kind of guidance for most of the seafood that comes to us that we do for those things that are farmed because of the regulations that have been put in place over the years governing the food that we eat. But not much, as much, nearly as much governing the sort of the, the policies concerning what comes out of the ocean or the health of the ocean itself. Oh, by the way, the choices that I favor are low on the food chain, of course. That's just simple. All cows, pigs, chickens, all the things that we raise are grazers. They eat plants. And never mind that some countries have been feeding cows to cows that shouldn't be. Cows get along perfectly well on grass and grain, and that's how they should be fed, not taking fish meal to feed the cows and pigs and chickens, grinding up wild fish to grow things that really don't naturally eat meat at all, let alone deep sea fish, but that's what we're doing. We need to be careful about that. We need to track that. It's our responsibility because we should be concerned about our life our bodies, our future, in a very individual sense, as well as in a global, where is humankind going, when we are really taking out of the ocean things that 
we should leave in the ocean, and we're putting into ourselves things we shouldn't be putting into ourselves. So what can you eat? Well, I suggest that th low on the food chain makes sense. That means consider catfish, consider tilapia. These are plant eaters, and they're cultivated. And concerning what it takes to make one, unlike some of the fish that we take from the sea that may be 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years old, for heaven's sakes, catfish are taken to market when they're less than a year old. Tilapia, similarly, about like what we would do with chickens. Chickens are now raised in a very efficient way so that you get sunlight, plants, protein in a very cost-effective way. And that's true with, it's cost-effective not only in dollars and cents with respect to how farmers view things, but also in terms of the environment, low on the food chain. So when you choose to eat, low on the food chain. Eat grazers if you eat meat. Certainly if you eat plants, that's about as low as you can go unless we start learning how to photosynthesize. But also I think that there are some possibilities that we should be looking at in the ocean, low on the food chain animals that we can, if we just invest in looking at these options. I know of a few companies that are doing this and taking the, the high route on this. One company is knowing that people are just so concerned about their omega-3s and realizing that the fish in the sea, such as tuna and salmon and swordfish, that are known for having a high level of omega-3s, they get it through the food chain. They have a high level because they're way up on the food chain. They eat fish that have concentrated things that started way down here and so on through the food chain. They, they bioaccumulated the good stuff as well as the not-so-good stuff that we don't want in us. They've concentrated these long-chain fatty acids. Well, this company I'm talking about says, uh -huh. well, why don't we start down here? And they're actually growing l the organisms in the sea that fix and generate, that manufacture the omega-3 fatty acids. And it's possible to simply get a little... I, as a kid, I used to take cod liver oil in these tablets. They were horrible. If, they, if I let them stay in my mouth long enough and they'd melt in... Ah, imagine cod liver oil. Not a pretty thought not a good taste. But, I mean, it's good for me, I guess. It was, my parents thought, because of the high vitamin content, omega-3 fatty acids. But when you think about having a way to access those, the way we do with so many things, here's this cornucopia of options in the ocean. It's a library of knowledge if we're smart enough to tap into it and say, what we want is omega-3 fatty acids, do you have to see this whole food chain sacrificed? These fish that might be 20 years old taken to market just because we want omega-3s? Why don't we get smart? Why don't we grow the omega-3s at the bottom of the food chain and consume them directly if that's what we want? There's so many pharmaceuticals out there in things like sponges, in certain corals, in certain seaweeds that we're just beginning to understand. We don't want to lose that, but that's what is at risk today, largely because of our food habits. And that's largely because we don't know. When we do know, we can make smarter, better choices. The Monterey Aquarium is providing a list of better choices. Other organizations are similarly adopting this. You can get a little card that says, here are the fish we definitely should not eat. Orange Ruffy is on that list. Bluefin Tuna is on that list. Chilean Sea Bass is on that list. I'll give you this long list. It's, my list is much longer. I have just sort of written off wildlife from the sea generally and believe that the future is responsible aquaculture. We have to get better about growing what we consume and have a lighter footprint not just on the land but out in the ocean as well. How does the oceans work vis-a-vis -vis currents and winds and things and how does what's happening with our temperature changing right. and how we've caused that in the right. currents. When you look at this jewel of a planet, this blue gem, it's obviously mostly water, but it isn't just water sitting there. As the world turns, the water moves. It's driven in some measure, the way that the ocean flows around the planet in part because of the way that the Earth is spinning, but it's also shaped by temperature and salinity. 
not all of the ocean has uniformly salt water. For the most part, it comes in around 35 parts per thousand salt to uh, water. Uh, the Great Salt Lake is much saltier than that, but there are also parts of, of the ocean that are saltier than that, and other parts that are much less salty, especially after a rain at the surface or around glaciers at the pole, where the melting that we're now seeing at, in polar seas is causing fresh water to float, basically float on the surface of saltier water below. Another thing that causes water of low salinity to float is temperature. Cold water, icy water, is heavier, more dense than light water. They say warm air rises and cold air sinks. You might feel that in a room. The same is true with ocean. Cold air, cold water sinks. Cold air, cold water. I mean, warm air, warm water uh, actually floats. The combination of salinity and temperature govern water masses in the sea. And they also provide a certain amount of integrity. That coupled with the motion of the earth as it spins are, are really governing these, these ribbons, these rivers in the sea that flow seemingly uh, out of an energy born by magic, but it isn't magic. It's just a result of these physical forces. When I was a kid, I first had a chance to become acquainted with a Gulf Stream in a small boat going out offshore from the Atlantic side of Florida. There's almost like a, a, a sharp division. There, there was the water that was calm and not moving apparently much at all along the, the coast, and then this, this super highway of clear, warm water just streaming up the coast. Actually, Benjamin Franklin <laughs> was the first to actually using ship captain's sketches, uh, really making known the existence of the Gulf Stream in ways that, that turned out to be useful to those who wanted to get from the United States over to Europe and back to avoid, to certainly take advantage of this fast run of the Gulf Stream as it comes up the coast of the United States and then bends eastward and goes off toward England. You can get a fast lift ride if you if you hop into the Gulf Stream, but you're really hard-pressed to fight it if you're in a sailing ship coming back. But there are countercurrents that you can ride coming back that also became known by ship captains over time. Well, these currents over the ages have changed. They're also influenced, of course, by the land masses, so that where currents, if, if there were no land in the ocean, the currents would be much different from the way they are because of the continents that interfere with the natural, otherwise natural flow of these currents that sweep around the planet. And there is, in recent times, evidence that what we now take as the, for granted as the, the rather moderate climate of Northern Europe, um, the fact that the Gulf Stream, with all its nice warmth, goes sweeping up in that direction and that our actions in recent times, the, the increase of, of um, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere causing a melting trend, a warming trend, so that more fresh water is being released into the North Sea and changing not just the flow of the, the Gulf Stream, but the, the cold water that would normally sink to the seafloor and go all underneath the Atlantic Ocean, emerging at other parts of the planet. This conveyor belt that has been described by oceanographers in recent times, this linking of currents. We only see the surface, but there are deep currents that flow under the surface, counter currents, uh, cold currents, warm currents that drive basically the flow of ocean water over the ages. So it takes a long time, let's say, for a drop of water that lands in the North Atlantic to wind up in Antarctica. But ultimately, over thousands of years, that journey is made. Or similarly, a drop of water from Antarctica flowing up along the, the coast of Peru and Chile. Um, it may take thousands of years to see that single 
bit of water make a journey up to another part of the ocean. But these, this mixing, this constant flow of what drives the way the warm and cold waters of the world function and have an impact on our climate, on our weather throughout the planet, are, are factors that we are only in recent times beginning to, to understand and to, to be able to see in three dimensions using acoustic means to find out the nature of where the, the ocean, what the configuration of the sea floor is that also shapes the way the currents go to use measures of the temperature changes, not just at the surface, but down deep within the sea, to understand what is driving the way the planet works. We don't have a complete picture yet, by any means. In fact, the mapping of the seafloor goes on. There are parts of the ocean that still appear as blank spaces, especially around Antarctica. We're getting a lot better so that we now recognize that there are mountain chains down the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans that shape the ocean currents, just as the continents above shape the way they flow. Of critical importance, though, as far as we're concerned, is what actions are we taking that could, could change something as powerful and as global and as system-wide as the currents in the sea? Well, it comes back to what we're putting into the atmosphere that is causing this warming trend. Actually, the trend is already in place, but we are enhancing that trend through our actions and in increasing the rate of melting of polar ice, which means that more fresh water is entering the sea to such an extent that we could interfere with these age-old processes of causing the sinking of, of cold water at the poles that ultimately drive things as basic as the Gulf Stream. So watch out, Europe, as time goes by. Through the actions that are taking place in our time, we have the capacity to profoundly do what people have said for ages they'd like to do. We'd like to control the weather. We'd like to control the climate. But we're not exactly controlling it, but we certainly are influencing it. Not a way that is exactly in our favor. Why do I love the ocean? It's because of the life in the sea. I just love the thrill of the exhilaration of diving. It's just so cool to go out and do what astronauts do up in space where they sort of float around. But in the ocean, you can do that. You can stand on one finger. You can be the most graceful creature <laughs> that you can imagine as a scuba diver or even just snorkeling. You're buoyed up by the water. And with a face mask, the single most important piece of diving equipment there is, you can see this wondrous other world. Uh, diversity of life on the land is amazing, but it's nothing like what you see under the sea. Half of the major divisions of life occur only in the ocean. That's it. That's where they are. You don't see starfishes on the land. You don't see jellyfishes pulsing around in the air got to go in the ocean to see a lot of the, of the real joy of life on Earth. And I have had more joy of this sort, I guess, than most. I, I've made a, a profession of it, basically, as a biologist, as somebody who is entranced with life. And the best way for me to understand ocean life, I figured out long ago, was to go in the ocean. Now, you can take little chunks and put them in a laboratory, and certainly I've become a great fan of what I consider to be halfway houses for fish and other creatures, the aquariums that have sprouted up around the world in recent times, not at all like the aquaria of years ago. They're really becoming quality places that some fish, I understand, stand in line to want to go to the fish spa where you get easy food and care for life, no predators to worry you. But the ocean is the big aquarium. That's where the action really is. My mother waited until she was 81 before she actually took the plunge and went into the sea and then scolded me for not getting her there sooner, and I'm really sorry I didn't. But using the, the techniques that have come along mostly in the 20th century, the last half of the 20th century, that we're still using, and more people all the time, scuba, snorkeling, a new thing called snuba, whatever it is, 
And even passenger submarines that will take you down into the sea, like getting onto a bus, you can go to Hawaii and go to Barbados and parts of Bahamas and actually get onto a, a passenger sub like a bus, the magic bus <laughs> that goes under the sea. Not deep usually, down to 100, 150 feet or so, about as deep as divers go. But I've had the joy of using some equipment that has taken me thousands of feet into the ocean. And I particularly like those I drive myself. Now, I'm not a big techno freak, although I do love technology. But the systems that I'm talking about are so simple that even a scientist can drive them. They're little cars that go underwater. They're submarines, not cars, but they look like little sports cars. And to be able to get inside with a dome over your head or inside a clear sphere, I've had the fun of helping with the design of some of these things, even though I'm not an engineer, to guide the direction of these basically like time machines that can take you into the sea to see what the world was like millions of years ago. Because these are the creatures that were around millions of years ago. Before there were dinosaurs, there were jellyfish. Before there were dinosaurs, there were starfish and crabs and a lot of things that you can see any day you choose by going out into the ocean. If I could, I'd take you there. I'll try to take you there just in your imagination. Imagine that you are out in the middle of the ocean and you step into this little bubble that takes you down into the sea. As you go through the blue, clear water at the surface, you start to see things right away that you're not going to see on the land. These little sparkly things and jellyfish that pulse by they look like miniature spacecraft, aliens that well, eat your heart out, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> the ocean is where these wondrous creatures are that are just beautiful, wonderful and beautiful. And they're not after us. We're not on their menu. They don't, wouldn't know what to do with us. We're land creatures that are new in their realm. Going deeper, the blue that you see at the surface, that is a clear, bright blue, changes. It gets darker and deeper through every shade of blue you can imagine because the light keeps changing as you go. And you see indigo and you see sapphire, you see cerulean, <laughs> whatever name you want to put on it, it's blue. And then it gets almost a purple blue. And there's life all the way. I mean, this is not just water you're descending through. It's like a liquid crystal, but it's filled with these creatures. And finally, you're getting down to where it's darker and darker, like the deepest twilight or the earliest light just before dawn. But then light disappears, or at least almost, because there are these flashes and sparkle and glow and pops of light, bioluminescence. Many people are familiar with fireflies, even glowworms, creatures that have the capacity to make their own light. They're rare on the land. They're extremely common underwater. And those who've dived at night, or even walking along the beach at night, in Southern California, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Mediterranean, all over the world, there are bioluminescent creatures that make their own light. Sometimes the brilliance of bioluminescence in the sea is so light that when a wave crashes, you see light all along the shore. Those who go out at sea at night might see a wake of brilliant blue fire following the ship. It's the, the light created by these living creatures that are disturbed, or sometimes they just flash because they flash. <laughs> Jellyfish. Some octopuses and squids, instead of squirting out black ink, they squirt out luminous ink. It doesn't do you much good in a black sea or dark sea to have dark ink, <laughs> but to have luminous ink glows in the dark. A predator would be fooled by that. And so a lot of these creatures, even some of the little shrimp, have little have the capacity to give out little puffs of bioluminescent light. And fish with lights down the side, like little ocean liners, or lights on the side that they, under their eyes that they use like flashlights they can see out in front of themselves, or they can turn it off and on by little shades above or below their eyes. There are just infinite variations on the theme of how bioluminescence, living light, is used in the sea. It may be the most common form of communication on the planet when you think about the fact that if you go down into the ocean, below a thousand feet. It's not only dark half the time, the way it is up in the upper parts of the planet. It's dark all of the time. It's cold and it's dark. But this is where most of life on Earth 
is. This is the biggest part of the biosphere, below a thousand feet. Remember the average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. I try to remember and remind myself, life on Earth lives in the dark and it's cold below a thousand feet. I've been diving in Hawaii in a little submarine, one of these cute little things that you drive into the sea at night. And you might as well be daytime because whether it's day or night, it's dark. And I found at a depth of, of 1,300 feet, an octopus bigger than I am, big, beautiful female octopus that had a clutch of eggs in her arms. My first thought was, it's a giant squid, but it wasn't a giant squid. It, it, I just, no one had seen one at that time, and we still haven't seen one by being in the ocean, although photographs have been taken of giant squids, these creatures that are as big as a bus, and it's only very recent times that we've even had a glimpse using a robot to get images of what a, this huge cephalopod, this squid, this biggest calamari on the planet, what it actually looks like. We know they exist because they've been caught in fishermen's net, nets, and that we know also because sperm whales that like to eat big squids have sucker disc marks on their body sometimes that extrapolating from that, how big does a creature have to be? They're huge, 60 feet long perhaps. We know they're at least 30 feet long with their tentacles that go out at another body length beyond that. So whatever, I thought I'd had the chance to see a giant squid until I counted the arms and there are eight arms. And although the behavior was sort of squid-like moving backwards the way squids do in the water, this one didn't move very fast. In fact, she was curious about me. And I say she because of the eggs. She came over. It was like a Gary Larson cartoon for a while. She was looking right in the submarine and said, who are you? What are you doing here? And then she'd back off and I'd move toward her. And then she'd stop and, and I'd move around. And for a while it was like a, a dance, like this. Uh, I'd stay still, she'd come toward me. Then I'd back off and she'd back off, and then I'd go toward her. It was, it was, it was wonderful. <laughs> Encounters like that in the ocean are so common. When you go into a coral reef and go diving, unlike a forest where you use binoculars to see the birds in the fish, in the, in, with fish in, in the sea, they come over to you, at least in places where they haven't been harassed. If they are innocent of what people can do to them, fish will come over and swim around you, follow you around. It's an exhilarating experience to engage wildlife on that basis. As a kid, I grew up on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. My parents moved to Florida when I was 12. I knew the Gulf of Mexico as this wondrous body of water that was as clear as the springs of Florida were also clear at the time, like a water you see in a glass. It was just crystalline. I went to school in clear water when clear water had clear water. That has changed. The waters, coastal waters around the world have changed. It came as a shock to me to hear people use the term dead zone. I started hearing it actually when I was serving as the chief scientist of NOAA, the National Ocean, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. My job as the chief scientist was to have oversight of some of the programs that the United States engages in with the weather, with atmospheric issues as well as the ocean. But news about a place off of Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, that began to form every year, such that the name dead zone was applied to it, was a shock. And I, I somehow had escaped knowing that this was a, a real issue, not just off the Mississippi River, but a phenomenon that began in the last couple of decades to be noticed around the world. This is a phenomenon that happens when a number of small planktonic organisms are favored by the circumstances that are there. It's usually in the summer when the water is warmer than is the case throughout the year. So increased water temperature combined with what appears to whatever triggers these things, apparently nutrients of a sort, and maybe other things that suppress the normal rich diversity of plankton. 
so that a few organisms are favored that just like the nature of whatever is in the ocean at that time. High level of nitrates, phosphates, a number of things that are increasingly characteristic of river mouths because of what's going on upstream. <laughs> I had a friend recently show me a, his view of the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't start at the shore, it starts way upstream at the, at the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And it includes all of these little rivers that flow into the Mississippi River. So the Gulf of Mexico is really that body of water that extends into the heartland of the United States that includes waters that are touching our farmlands, touching our backyards, touching our golf courses, touching the rivers, lakes, and streams into which flow all of what we do upstream that comes downstream with these disastrous results at the mouth, mouth of the Mississippi, a place that some characterize it as by size as saying it's bigger than New Jersey out there in the Gulf of Mexico that is dead. It isn't quite dead in that there is life at a microbial level, but the organisms that are favored by this rich growth of, of circumstance driven by whatever it is that they like, that they are super abundant, they consume all of the available oxygen, leaving what is known as an anoxic layer or zone anoxic, no oxygen area. So everything dies. The fish that normally would be there die. The little organisms that can't tolerate these, this enhanced circumstance of life that favors a few, that just go crazy and gobble up the oxygen, they all go away. The little crabs, the shrimp, the whole suite of normal organisms. And ultimately, even the organisms that prosper so well initially also fade off the chart and they die. So you really get a, this mysterious, empty piece of the ocean. It's not a pretty picture, not a good thing to happen. A few years ago, I heard that around the world, not just in the Gulf of Mexico, off the Mississippi, there were on the order of 50 such areas that were popping up around the mouths of rivers caused by whatever it is that happens upstream that flows and takes these unnatural things, the pesticides, the herbicides, the the stuff that we put on our lawns, the stuff that we allow to flow onto our streets that go into the drains that ultimately go out into the sea. All of this is the legacy of what we're doing to the ocean. More recently, it's not 50, it's 150 such areas. And just this, uh, most recently of all, the area where I was a kid, where I loved the creatures around Tampa Bay, around Clearwater, around Sarasota. This, just in the year 2005, that area has entered this growing list of really terribly afflicted areas where the fish die, everything dies for some period of time. Now, because the ocean so far is, has considerable resilience, fresh water comes in, fish, dead fish, finally go back into the sea as nutrients. And next year there's another chance. Depending on what we do upstream, depending on whatever it is that we're doing that is so wrong and is so damaging, we have a chance to see recovery. But only if we understand what drives these dead zones, what drives toxic algal blooms. There have always been blooms as the ocean changes and Circumstances favor this little group of organisms and others fade away for a while. But what's new is our swift changes and the magnitude of our changes in the chemistry of the ocean that should be like a red light flashing, should be a SOS, cause for alarm. The ocean's in trouble. What are we going to do about it? We need to really focus on what's driving these nasty conditions because it affects our health in the end. It affects the economy of these areas. It affects, out. affects our life. Oh, no. <laughs> I love the idea of a message to future generations because I have children. I have four grandsons. I have future generations in my own household. <laughs> and I think about the future all the time because I've seen change happen so fast in my lifetime. The world that was when I was a child doesn't exist anymore. 
I, I listened to my parents talk about the world that existed when they were children. That didn't exist by the time I came along. Some important things are missing. I never had a chance to know a passenger pigeon. There are whole categories of things that, if I could, I'd bring them back. Right now, I have a chance. All of us around right now have a chance to protect things that will be gone for those generations in the future. Unless we are smart, unless we're wise, unless we really take actions while we still have a chance. I'm haunted by the thought of those future generations asking me. I dream about it. Why didn't you do something when there still were blue whales? There were some there when you were there, and you didn't do whatever it takes to maintain an ocean where they could survive and thrive. You were there when there were those neat creatures called beluga whales, those they're magical creatures, or anything that is now really looking as though it is in trouble, but it's beyond individual species. It's whole ecosystems, coral reefs. There is real concern that in 50 years, generations will be asking us, why didn't you do something? These extraordinary places that were a part of, of your experience, a part of your planet when you were there, even if we didn't experience them, they're part of our legacy or not, depending on our actions. I guess, I hope that I will be asking the generations of the future not to forgive me and forgive those of us who are around for not doing more, to do what we could, what we can do right now, that we will lose the chance by the next 50 years unless we take actions now. I hope that my my question isn't, my, my message is not one of, of asking for, for forgiveness, but rather to ask them to be inspired by the actions that we are taking, that have made a difference, to keep it going, to not give up, to not think that everything is always going to be okay no matter what they do, but to realize from our experience and from those who've gone before, that we have the capacity not only to change things in a negative way, but to change things in a positive way. I'm so grateful to those who caused national parks to come into being. If we had this, if nobody before this time had taken such actions, imagine where we could start. I have the Grand Canyon would probably be bridged over, and as some have proposed many times, there'd be things that would not be exactly the in keeping with the wondrous place that we now know and love. The Great Smoky Mountains were brought back from a trend that would have left them or taken them more and more toward carving up into little pieces. Instead, I'm so grateful to those who preceded me, who took actions to sort of pause and rebuild and restore that fabulous part of the Appalachian Mountains and all the ecosystems and the waters and critters that go along with it and our historic legacy, our cultural legacy as well. All these things are at risk every day unless we take actions. So I guess if I could send a message, it would be one of hope to those in the future, to inspire those kids coming along, to realize that they have the potential to make a difference, to find a place for humankind within these natural systems that support us all. You don't have to give up and say it's over, that it's hopeless, but rather, what can we do now to magnify the positives, to protect the natural systems that we don't know how to put back together again, restore what we can, to realize that the economics that we value so much are really embodied in a healthy planet, that if we trash the nature, natural systems, we're trashing the economies, any hope that humankinds can survive. But if we take care of the land, the water, the wildlife, certainly the ocean, we're writing for ourselves an insurance policy that can endure far into the future.